everyone. Um, we have uh, another exciting uh, IDC lunch today. Uh, and as we discussed uh, last week, uh, uh, there was a major storm that happened in the universe 1.3 billion years ago. Uh, and uh, we will continue to discuss it today. It happened, unfortunately, far enough so that our space time was not worth the lot, so our clocks are still relatively precise. Um, and uh, Ido Berger will uh, give us an update about that. Uh, we just had an excellent um, ITC colloquium by Ethan Kuzniak, who is visiting us uh, from Johns Hopkins. Uh, Ethan used to be a graduate student in the theory corridor uh, when Bill Press was still around. Uh, he was using uh, and Ethan will tell us, uh, uh, we'll discuss something else uh, uh, later on at lunch. So we'll start with uh, Ido Berger, that uh, we'll talk about uh, this gravitational wave source that now has a name, a GW15 for the, the year 2015, uh, September 14, just like with gamma rivers. And I actually heard uh, that uh, they have another one as significant as this one. I don't know much about it. Uh, but they have many more in the can. Obviously, if you have a 28 sigma detection, there must be many more lying in the same data set. So we are into a new era where there will be many events uh, coming up from uh, LIGO, and uh, we better follow them up. That's what people will discuss. Um, and uh, after that, we'll hear from Ethan uh, about colloidal magnetic fields in disks. And uh, later, we'll hear from the CFA colloquium speaker, Jonathan Rubin. Is he around? Yeah. Oh, right here. Great. Uh, and he will tell us, he uh, is visiting us from Cornell, and will tell us about getting oxygen in Jupiter, Saturn, and exogiant planets. And finally, we'll hear from our own uh, Yan Fei Jiang. Uh, he will tell us about iron opacity bump changes and the stability and structure of accretion disks in active galactic nuclei. Hey, thanks, Avi. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, the discovery of this gravitational wave event, but I want to really focus a bit more uh, today on the electromagnetic follow-up and tell you a bit or give you a sense of the kind of insider view of how things progressed uh, since the discovery until the announcement um, last week. Uh, so the results uh, that I'll talk about are, uh, partly are summarized in these two papers that we posted uh, on the archive on, uh, uh, on Monday. So I'm sure you're all aware that LIGO announced its uh, first gravitational wave detection. Uh, the waveforms from the two detectors are shown here, uh, along with models for uh, black hole binary mergers. And you can see the beautiful match between the data and the theory. Uh, in terms of the significance of the event, this is an estimate of the background uh, and then the detection uh, here, it's actually hard to estimate how significant the event is because LIGO hasn't accumulated enough background to really get to that, uh, that level. But an extrapolation of the background excluding this event uh, shows you that it's highly significant, much greater than five sigma, in fact. So based on the waveform data, uh, they can estimate the masses of the individual components. There are about uh, 30 solar mass black holes. Uh, the merger accredited a distance of about 400 megaparsecs. The final product is about 60 solar masses, uh, fairly rapidly spinning. And what was important for us uh, uh, astronomical observers was the localization area, which is shown here. Uh, uh, the region was about 600 square degrees. Uh, now, this is the final localization map. The original localization map that was released to, uh, to observers, in fact, had two of these regions, one in the southern hemisphere, which is shown here, one in the northern hemisphere. So it was actually significantly larger. Uh, it turns out with uh, finer analysis that the southern hemisphere region is, is the correct one, uh, not the northern hemisphere. Uh, this was fortuitous for us because we were using a telescope in Chile uh, to do the follow-up. So a lot of people followed up the region in the north, and it turns out that that was not the, the right place. So just a few um, implications of this detection. Uh, it's, it's quite significant in and of itself as the first direct detection of gravitational waves. But there are a lot of interesting parts of the story. The masses for the, that were measured for the black holes are larger than any masses uh, from X-ray binaries, which are in the range of 6 to 15 solar masses. Uh, it narrows down a little bit the uh, uh, black hole binary merger rate. So the current estimate is somewhere between 200 and 400 per gigaparsecube per year. That, of course, depends on the mass function of the black holes. 
Uh, before LIGO started, the range was somewhat larger, uh, so we're slowly shrinking it down. Um, the large black hole masses seem to require progenitors uh, with low metallicity to avoid large mass loss uh, due to stellar winds. Um, and, but the formation channel, whether this, this is a primordial system of, that start with two massive stars or what dynamically formed in a globular cluster is, is uh, unknown with this one event. It's also unclear whether this is a system that merged rapidly in a relatively nearby uh, low metallistic galaxy or formed a long time ago at high redshift uh, and then took uh, billions of years to merge. So these kind of uh, issues will be addressed in the future with a larger sample of events and looking at the redshift distribution, for example. Okay, so what about the electromagnetic follow-up? So, in, um, so the, this has been uh, discussions about uh, doing electromagnetic follow-up observations of LIGO detection has been going on for several years. Um, and eventually in April of 2014, it was decided uh, partially through input from the uh, observational community and partly from the gravitational wave community uh, that we will sign a memorandum of understanding with LIGO, which will give us access uh, to, um, to events found by LIGO. Um, and in exchange, um, the MOU stipulated confidentiality. So uh, we would not be able to uh, publish any of the results or discuss them or disseminate them in any way before the LIGO-Virgo uh, collaboration published their results, which is why our papers appeared two days after the announcement uh, and not two days before. Now, the thing that was interesting from kind of a sociological point of view is that this particular event actually occurred two days before the official start of the science run. Okay, so it happened at the very end of the engineering run. Um, so it was kind of a benefit and a curse, but it means that there was a two-day delay uh, between the time the event was discovered and when it was actually communicated uh, to us that something has happened. Okay, so, um, so we've been running, uh, in anticipation of the first science run, uh, a target of opportunity program with a dark energy camera on the CTIO four meter telescope in Chile uh, in collaboration with the dark energy survey uh, plus quite a few members from the community. Uh, and I'm the PI of this program. So we're taking advantage of a three uh, degree squared field of view instrument uh, shown here, uh, sitting on a four meter telescope with red sensitive CCDs. And uh, the idea, the motivation for this was that we're looking for uh, the signatures of neutron star binary mergers in the optical. Uh, they're supposed to have red colors and they're supposed to be faint and we need to search these large areas. So this is a particularly uh, powerful combination um, in fact, the most powerful instrument for this purpose in the Southern Hemisphere uh, right now. Um, and this is also the centerpiece of a broader uh, program to study gravitational wave, uh, to follow up gravitational wave sources. So the idea is that this is the first line of attack in terms of finding a counterpart, and then we can follow up from there in uh, X-rays uh, with spectroscopy and uh, radio observations. So we received uh, the announcement of, uh, of this event on um, uh, September 16th, uh, so I was actually out of town and I uh, sent this email after talking to a few friends in LIGO trying to understand, is this real? What's going on? You know, we didn't really expect a detection on the very first day of the science run. Um, so uh, this is the email I sent to our team saying, um, it looks like there's a lot of excitement in the consortium, in the Virgo consor LIGO Virgo consortium, so it's probably real. We also figured that because this happened two days before the science run started, it probably wasn't an injected fake event because that seemed a little bit too perverse to do. <laughs> um, uh, it was the, the other interesting part is that this was triggered by the burst search. So the burst search is not a template-driven search. It's just searching for excess signal uh, in the noise. Um, and that's sensitive to black hole binary mergers. The, um, the CBC search, the compact binary coalescence search, is sensitive to neutron star, neutron star, neutron star black hole mergers, actually did not trigger on this automatically. After the fact, it was recovered. So that seemed to indicate right away that this was either a black hole binary merger or something else. Uh, and I'll come back to the something else in a second. And then the southern part of the localization region was uh, visible to us, and I thought this was really the opportunity to establish the, our dominance of the field on day one. Okay, so what did we actually do? So, uh, so we observed um, 75 square degrees along the main probability ridge of this banana-shaped region 
Um, starting four days after the event, so two days after the announcement was the first time we could get on, on the sky, and then three days later, and then two weeks later. Um, and we uh, observed in the I and Z bands, so in the red part of the uh, optical regime, to about 23rd, 22nd magnitude. So this turned out to be deeper and wider area than any of the other optical searches that were done for this event, um, of, of the various telescopes that have participated. Now, initially, we covered about 30% of the total probability um, of the localization region, but then eventually the localization region got shifted away from where we actually observed. So you can see that the final region has this ridge of high probability here, and we observed over here, uh, which was the original high probability region. So we ended up covering only 10% of the area. Now, in these uh, fields, in the 75 square degrees, we searched for transient sources. We found about 2,400 of them. Um, and we searched for ones that faded between four and seven days and were absent at 24 days. This is not based on any particular specific model. The idea is to try to rule out long-term transients like supernovae um, and look for something that fades rapidly. Um, and that reduced the number of candidates to zero. So it goes. So we did not find uh, or claim any candidate to the gravitational wave event itself. Now, the other interesting thing you can see in this map is that this probability region intersects the LMC, the Large Magellanic Cloud. So we noticed that right away uh, at the beginning. And because the uh, event was discovered as a burst signal and not necessarily through a template of a, of a merger, we thought, what if this was actually a core collapse supernova in the LMC? So we carried out detailed observations uh, of the LMC. Um, and the idea was that, uh, particularly looking for, well, if there was a supernova in the LMC, it would have been bright enough to, to be seen with the naked eye. And there was no uh, supernova seen. So we essentially searched for silent core collapse. So a system that directly collapsed to a black hole and does not leave behind a, a bright supernova signature. So we looked at catalogs, uh, both in our, from our own images, but also known catalogs of supergiants and luminous blue variable stars in the LMC, we searched for a 1,000 of them. Um, and all the ones that happened to lie in our coverage area, so 95% of them, were still there. Okay, so, so as far as we know, no star uh, disappeared in the LMC uh, at the same time as the signal. Okay, so that, that rules out uh, this idea. Now, you know, after the fact, now we know, which we didn't know at the time, that this is really a black hole binary merger at 400 megaparsecs and not something in the LMC. Okay, so looking forward, so this was a lot of fun uh, for the last few months, even though we couldn't tell anybody about this uh, until a few days ago. Uh, but I think this is, this is quite amazing. I mean, it's really the beginning of a new field in, in astrophysics. Advanced LIGO uh, can detect these uh, mergers. The uh, observational astronomy community uh, as a whole uh, demonstrated the ability to respond to these triggers and image very large areas on the sky. I would point out that, that most facilities that are used for this purpose are still, in my mind, underpowered when we compare to theoretical predictions of what these counterparts should look like. But still, the fact is that there are, uh, there's a large community of people that is ready to respond. The second science run will start later this year, will last six months. It will have four times the volume coverage of the first science run. And Advanced Virgo is supposed to come online as well. So, uh, that means more precise positions for any sources that are detected. And given our estimates of the neutron star binary merger rate, uh, there's a good chance that we'll have uh, over order one event uh, discovered in this next science run. Could also be zero. Um, I, I think that the dark energy camera is, is really going to be the premier instrument in the southern hemisphere for detecting optical counterparts for the foreseeable future until L LSST comes online in, uh, in a few years. Um, and I think that robust detections of counterparts are imminent. Until then, we'll let the theorists write a lot of speculative papers about what these counterparts should be. Okay. Thank you. No comment. <laughs> <laughs>
comment about the reality of this discussion? What, what do you think? Yeah, I think it's really interesting. So, so I think there's a lot of uh, ongoing debate about this. So they claim a four sigma detection uh, within 0.4 seconds of the timing of the gravitational wave signal. Um, so I'm still waiting for independent analysis of the data. And there are, I think, several groups that are independently looking at the GBM data. Uh, there's also a non-detection from the integral satellite, which has somewhat different characteristics. But uh, the argument of the integral team is that if that was a real signal, they should have seen something really booming in their data, and they don't. Um, and then uh, I'm not sure that the significance of the event was calculated correctly. So it's been pointed out by several people that um, the false alarm rate that they claim is underestimated, and it's more like close to 50%. Yeah, because in Marshall, we think about it also very differently from the spectrum. Because yeah. They don't cover the fact that it's an image. Yes, yeah. So I, I think it will be interesting. If, if, this is, if it's really the case that, that this was a real, um, uh, real signal, then I think the future events should be accompanied by similar signals. I mean, presumably, it's not a highly beam signal if it was seen in the first one. So in the north, I think it's uh, probably the nearest thing is PanStars. Um, Subaru has the large, I mean, it has the large collecting area and wide field instrument, but I think the, as far as I know, the, the team that runs this uh, type of uh, program on Subaru has only been allocated a few hours of observing time. So I think the problem with Subaru is that it's just an oversubscribed facility. So, yeah. well, so SWIFT did, um, so SWIFT was, I don't think it would cover this part of the sky at the same time. So the SWIFT, the bat field of view is only 15% of the sky. There was a uh, follow-up with the X-ray telescope on SWIFT of individual galaxies within the aero region covering about 20 galaxies just on the off chance that this was some nearby but event. Is that, I, I was referring to the, but the white field. Yeah, no, they, I don't think they covered that part of the sky. Yeah, can we put any uh, meaningful constraints on massive gravity? What do you think of that? Or potential reality? You mean the gravitational wave data or the combination with the electromagnetic? Either one. I think the gravitational wave. Like massive gravity with the massive gravity. Well, yeah, they didn't. They derived the limit of one of the potential amount of 65 grams after limit from the mass of the gravity. Ah. Well, so, <laughs> so for two reasons. First of all, when this was announced, uh, it wasn't clear that this was a black hole binary, right? Um, that was not uh, known right away. Um, and as I mentioned, this is one of the reasons we searched for a, a core collapse supernova in the, in the LMC. Um, the other reason is that, you know, it's definitely worth the effort in case there is an electromagnetic signal. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think that right now we're operating also under the uh, um, assumption that there will be one event and we had enough time to follow up one event. If the event rate now becomes uh, one per week or one per day, it will become a new challenge. Obviously, it would be much easier to localize these things to get two LIGO, LIGO stations if you only take the bad or the Well, so, so Advanced Virgo is coming online for the fir next science run. Mm -hmm. That will provide a third station. Uh, there is a detector called Kagra that's being uh, built in Japan that should come online in a couple of years. 
And then there is a plan to build a LIGO clone in India. Um, so that will provide a fifth detector. So I think by the early 2020s, uh, we'll probably have five detectors operating worldwide. And then the positions will probably be at the scale of uh, 10 square degrees or a few square degrees, which makes it much easier than 600 square degrees. Yeah, the GBM detection, if it's correct, by the way, doesn't help the position very much. I mean, the GBM positions on the sky are just as bad as the LIGO positions. So, uh, so you need something else, and I think that's what Josh is referring to. Yeah. Anyway, exciting times. I have one back in my desk. Ah, okay. Okay, um, so I'm going to totally switch gears on you because instead of talking about something that's current and exciting, I'm going to be talking about something that's been bothering me for years. Um, uh, it could still be exciting, but um, you know, I've, it's bothered me for so many years that I'm almost bored about it. It's sorry, um, but I feel better about it today, so I'll talk about it. Uh, the question is how accretion disks acquire poloidal flux. This is a a major problem in understanding what's going on because these days we invoke an embedded poloidal field to explain jets from accretion disks. And unfortunately, attempts to simulate global simulations of accretion disks show no signs of generating the required poloidal field. And there's not any convincing model, theoretical model, for why it should be there either. I hope I'm not offending anyone when I say that. So the obvious thing is to try to invoke the environment of the accretion disk for the poloidal field and just imagine that it accretes whatever poloidal flux intersects the disk, which is a perfectly sensible idea. But it's been known for a long time that there is a simple and straightforward argument that speaks strongly against this. Um, I think the earliest work I'm aware of is Van Bellahoyen in 1989. There was a follow-up paper in the mid-90s. And the conclusion is that you basically can't do it, although they didn't put it quite like that. So um, to understand the simple argument, you need to look at this diagram that I grabbed off the internet. Uh, here's the shaded accretion disk seen in cross-section, and here's the external field being accreted inward and being bent by this process. You, the bending necessarily produces a radial component of the magnetic field, which flips sign across the accretion disk. And the accretion speed is slow. It's like alpha times the sound speed in the disk times the height to radius. Um, the diffusion rate across the midplane is relatively fast. It's the turbulent diffusion coefficient divided by the thickness of the disk squared. And when you balance these things out, you find that generically you get a static configuration when the radial field is of order um, h over r times the vertical field. 
which corresponds to a bending angle of h over r, which for a thin disk is negligibly small, which means that if you try to accrete the disk inward, it just doesn't move. The plasma streams by it, and that's the end of it. Um, and people haven't paid that much attention to this conclusion, or not nearly as much as they should, because it seems wrong. Um, but not for any good reason. It just violates everything else. Um, so people basically dislike it because it's hard to make jets and accretion disks if this is true. Numericists dislike it for the simple reason that when people have tried to simulate this process, it works. The poloidal field seems to move inward. Now you can argue about how reliable the, the, or general the simulations are, but that is the fact. Um, and the obvious fix within the context of this argument is to make vertical diffusion much less efficient compared to radial transport um, by the factor of the geometric thin thinness of the disk. And there's no good theoretical reason why anyone's ever come up with why this should be the case. And in particular in the simulations, while the turbulence is anisotropic, the turbulent coefficients don't differ by that much. So I'm going to point out quickly two things that are wrong with this argument. Um, first of all, this argument neglects buoyancy. Um, if you have a turbulent disk, and the disk should be turbulent because it's ionized and the MRI is operating, then um, you get fluctuations of order unity in the local magnetic field, which means that the magnetic pressure fluctuates by order unity, which since these are um, operating slower than the sound speed, they're more or less isobaric. That means that the gas density fluctuates by um, a fractional amount, which is the ratio of the magnetic pressure to the total pressure, which means that the magnetic rich field regions move upward. Every eddy turnover time, they move upward about an eddy thickness. Um, well, depends. Less, I guess, in general, but they move upward with the buoyant speed for one eddy turnover time. And if you work that out, that's like dimensionless viscosity times the distance to the midplane times the rotation rate. Um, that's systematically moving you away from the midplane. Okay, the diffusion um, should be pushing you toward the midplane because that's where B sub R switches sign. So you get to balance the two, and you find that the angle has to be corrected. It can be of order H over R near the midplane, but then it rises um, as the Z squared in the exponent which means a few pressure scale heights up, you have a relatively big number multiplying a relatively small number, which means I have no idea what it is, really. But it's not small, <laughs> or it's not very small. Um, so that's a little bit inconclusive. But then there's a second point, which is that um, we have magnetic helicity conservation. The twistiness of the magnetic field is being conserved locally. and Electric field components parallel to the large scale field are preferentially suppressed, which means that magnetic field, um, electric field components in the azimuthal direction are being suppressed. And the electric field that corresponds to the vertical gradient of the radial magnetic field is in the azimuthal direction. So magnetic helicity gives you a dynamical suppression. And the way you can take care of that is project out components parallel to the large scale field. So this is what you would normally have. Oops, sorry. Um, this is what you'd normally have <coughs> due to vertical gradients. This is the diffusion coefficient. And this is the projection operator. Um, and I left out a word. But the predominant, it, in a disk where the toroidal field, the large scale field is predominantly toroidal, you get a dramatic suppression of the azimuthal term here. Um, and the naive estimate would be basically the non-azimuthal components squared divided by the total magnetic field. Um, there's another effect, which is that part of the um, a, a term due to the, azim the vertical gradient of the azimuthal field is now projected into the azimuthal direction by the projection operator. And that gives you something that looks like this which is basically telling you that there's a drift velocity of the radial field towards zeros of the toroidal field. Um, if the field components are perfectly correlated, this actually gives you back the usual dissipation term. Um, but if you have a small perturbation to the local field, 
then there's a little bit of diffusion, but basically it's just a drift towards zeros of the toroidal field. Simulations of disk dynamos seem to indicate that you get a kind of butterfly pattern where the field is generated a little ways away from the midplane and then moves outward. So the zeros of the field drift upward. Um, and this means that you trap and remove radial field due to um, your imposed poloidal radial field. So um, that suggests that actually accreting a weak toroidal field should be very easy for an accretion disk. Um, buoyancy will help. Helicity seems like a very strong argument. This will break down eventually. When the um, external field becomes concentrated enough, then its effects are no longer negligible. It's not a trace component. And um, you'll start to get the diffusion term competing once again with accretion when the ratio of the energies, bz squared to the total b squared, is about h over r. So still small, but not very small. At that point, you have bending of order unity in the external field lines. And because the external field lines open up on the whole sky, and of course processes within the disk have to go within the disk, you have um, as much angular momentum going out through the magnetosphere as you do through the disk. So that level of external magnetic field is going to have a strong effect on the structure of the accretion disk. So what this is telling you is that accretion disks will accrete from their environment all the available poloidal field. And if the disk has a small enough inner radius so that it, the concentration is allowed to be large enough, then somewhere toward the inner edge of the disk, the external field will sooner or later become a very important component of the disk dynamics. If you consider a black hole in a binary system so that the external poloidal field is supplied by the companion and it's got typical poloidal field strength for a star, then a cataclysmic variable disk with a ratio of only about 30 between the outer and inner edges is usually not big enough to create this effect. On the other hand, a black hole in a binary system, that's big enough. So generically, you expect this effect to be important for creating black holes in binary systems. Difficult to make it important for white dwarfs. OK, that's all I have to say. Um, what kind of systems are we talking about? Protostellar? Like, uh, yeah, the class zero, class one protostars, HL tau, EMC, this has some work on that. We're just looking at kind of a vaguely toroidal field. L1527, Delany Trigger, and Cox, all the same thing. The problem is that now, when you get down to this kind of sub 30 AU scale, where a lot of HL tau is obviously thick, we're probably seeing scattering, which could sort of masquerade as a toroidal field, and will tell you nothing about the field at all. So that's an additional wrench we have to do. In terms of 100 AU scale ones, which is probably optically thin enough to be tracing actual field alignment, we just see toroidal. I don't know what to say about that particularly. I mean, I was thinking about fully ionized disks and protostellar disks are more complicated. Um, the, uh, this argument really works only for ionized disks, so it's only going to work for the inner regions of a protostellar disk. How is it? Well, how, where's the dead zone around 4AU? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah we're, we're, we're not toroidal yet. Yeah. Well, I, that, that's where this argument works. Otherwise, life gets very complicated. Well, it, it, it does make a connection between the environment and the size of the disk and um, where 
an inner magnetically dominated region will emerge. Now, I don't know how to translate that right now into observational, an observational program, but it seems as though that's something that shouldn't be out of our reach. Oh, oh, excuse me. Then let me answer the question differently. What are these observational constraints you're talking about? I don't know. <laughs> Okay, well, I apologize. I'm dressed up for a colloquium. Um, I don't usually dress this way for lunch. But uh, anyway, it's a pleasure to be here. I want to talk about a problem involving understanding the abundance of oxygen in giant planets. The carbon to oxygen and the, the carbon in particular, not only the C to O, but the carbon to hydrogen and oxygen to hydrogen ratios are really fundamental to understanding giant planet formation. Uh, they tell us uh, in part about whether giant planets form through core accretion or uh, through disk instability. And they're also important to understanding the nature of terrestrial planet formation in the context of giant planet formation. And if we know the uh, carbon and oxygen abundances in parent stars, we can say something about uh, how much contamination has occurred from planet formation and so forth. So these are important numbers, and of course, carbon and oxygen are among the most abundant elements produced by nucleosynthesis in stars. So uh, hot Jupiters are actually pretty easy. Uh, if we can get their spectra, all the major carbon and oxygen-bearing species, uh, CO, H2O, methane, et cetera, are in the visible atmosphere. And, and this has been done to some extent with uh, HST and with Spitzer, but uh, to really do a thorough job, we want to use a bigger hammer, and that's JWST. And so, in fact, uh, in the time that I have as an interdisciplinary scientist, those of you who think of me as an astrobiologist would think I'm going to use it to try to find atmospheres that have evidence for life uh, around super-Earths, and no way, I'm not going to throw my time away on that. Uh, I'm going to look at giant planet atmospheres and try to get these species. And JWST should... Uh, provide very, very high signal-to-noise spectra uh, in giant planet transits. On Jupiter and Saturn, carbon is easy. Uh, it's mostly in methane, and we have excellent uh, spectra of methane for both Jupiter and Saturn, and also Uranus and Neptune. Uh, we also, with the Galileo probe, have methane measured directly through mass spectrometry, and those agree with the uh, spectroscopic data, the near IR data, so we know what the carbon abundance is through the methane abundance. And all of this assumes that these bodies are well mixed and, and convective and so forth, which uh, we have to assume for the moment because we have uh, no other indication. Water, however, is really tough. Uh, the Galileo probe didn't get Jovian water. Uh, first of all, in Jupiter and Saturn, the temperatures are low enough that water clouds form. Uh, you have to get deep below the water clouds, about 10 bars on Jupiter. But Galileo probe fell into an area of large-scale subsidence, and the water mixing ratio, the profile of that, uh, was very, very strange. And uh, it was very much subsolar. And it's very clear that it was a meteorological effect rather than anything to do with the global water abundance. So we have this mission, Juno, which will arrive at Jupiter on July 4th, uh, which will measure the water abundance in the 100 bar region <clears throat> well below the clouds with a microwave radiometer. That's a very expensive way to go about this. <clears throat> Saturn is tough overall because its atmosphere is colder. And so I want to talk about how to do this on Saturn in the remaining five minutes. 
So first of all, this is a plot of cloud structure, predicted cloud structure on Saturn, temperature versus cloud density. I want you to ignore all the detail, and the only thing I want you to notice is that the predicted cloud base, and this is for uh, five times solar oxygen, which is consistent with the methane measurements, that cloud base is at about 20 bars pressure. The corresponding cloud base on Jupiter is 10 bars. The Galileo probe on Jupiter got down to 22 bars, but again, the atmosphere in that region, it was a five micron hot spot, was anomalous, and we don't think that the uh, bulk water abundance was measured. But getting measurements from down uh, here at 20 bars is possible, but because this is just where the cloud base is, you really want to get down to 30 or 40 bars to make sure that you're below the cloud base and that you actually have bulk water rather than water affected by meteorology. And that's difficult to do. It's hard to get a signal out. It's hard to get the probe down to that level quickly enough that the relay spacecraft is going to be able to actually receive the signal. So uh, with my graduate student, Don Wang, we've been looking at a different way to do this, assuming that there's a Saturn probe mission equivalent to the Galileo probe, which, by the way, was way back in 1995. Uh, NASA is considering one of these for the New Frontiers mission. And so what we've been doing is looking at using disequilibrium species that have information on the oxygen abundance to determine uh, the uh, deep abundance of water in Saturn. So what you see here is a plot that Dong prepared from uh, equilibrium chemistry uh, in Saturn. There are no reaction rates here. It's all uh, equilibrium. Temperature versus mixing ratio. You see methane, water, ammonia, the major constituents, all relative to hydrogen, which would be one. Here's helium. And you see that carbon monoxide and ethane are here at the sort of part per uh, billion to 10 parts per billion level as you go deeper into the atmosphere of Saturn. And in fact, these species do contain the information we need to determine uh, the deep oxygen abundance. And the way this works is in this artfully designed uh, view graph here, intended to show uh, the deep atmosphere of Saturn below 500 bars and the upper atmosphere of Saturn at 10 bars where the probe can actually reach. If we focus first on the deep atmosphere, we're in a region where temperatures are high enough that reaction rates go very fast. And so the chemical reactions that convert carbon monoxide to methane and back again occur on a much shorter time scale than the time in which molecules are mixed out of this region, that is mixed upward. And indeed, the abundance of carbon monoxide then can be written as an equilibrium constant times the mole fractions uh, of the methane and the water. So we know what the methane abundance is, and it's the water that we want to get. Now, we can't measure at this level. This is down at 500 bars. But we can wait till these molecules find their way to the visible upper atmosphere. And um, in fact, what uh, we can do with a CO molecule that's at 10 bars is recognize the fact that there is some threshold region at which the chemical reaction time, which is given here by a single reaction coefficient. We do not use a single reaction coefficient. We actually have a full-scale chemical model. Uh, but this symbolizes uh, what uh, the dependency is here. It depends on the pressure, depends on the number density, the equilibrium constant, and so forth. That chemical equilibration time, the time it takes for CO to come to equilibrium with the other species, at some point in the atmosphere must uh, equal and then exceed the mixing time, which is symbolized here by some length scale of the eddies divided by the eddy mixing coefficient, essentially a vertical uh, upwelling velocity. Above this point, the CO abundance is fixed. And we can then, with the probe, and I apologize for these animations, um, with a probe, we can measure the CO abundance here if we know what the vertical mixing speed is and if we know what the chemical kinetics are. So these are the two problems. But as far as the vertical mixing speed goes, we have a friend. And that friend is ethane. Ethane uh, is also produced deep down in the uh, 500 bar region and below. And this is a plot that Dong prepared. It shows the abundance versus this vertical mixing coefficient. You see that it's independent of the water abundance. Those are three different water mixing ratios. And so from measuring the ethane ratio, 
we can get the vertical mixing coefficient, as long as we are deep enough in the atmosphere that we're not measuring ethane produced by photochemistry. So 10 bars is the right place to be, high enough that it's quenched and deep enough that it's not photochemical. And then once we have that, we get an eddy mixing coefficient, let's say 10 to the 8. We then measure CO. This is all done with a mass spectrometer. Uh, these are for three different eddy mixing coefficients. And voila, we have the enrichment of water. We have the water abundance relative to hydrogen and therefore the oxygen to hydrogen ratio deep in Saturn. The problem, however, is you see there are six curves here for three eddy mixing coefficients, and that's because there's a big argument in the community about the kinetics, the rates of these reactions. Uh, there are many reactions that interconvert the carbon monoxide and the methane. They involve things like formaldehyde and various other intermediate species. And this dotted line series is from one kinetic scheme, and the solid line series is from another scheme. So I happen to pick this one, but I could just as easily have picked this one, which would lead to a much larger water enrichment. We don't know which of these schemes is correct. One way to work this out would be to measure a second species, like car uh, carbon dioxide, and by measuring both of these at the 10 bar level, we would get both the vertical mixing and the kinetics. The problem is that the CO2 abundance is predicted to be uh, very, very low. If you go back to these uh, graphs, you'll see that the CO2 abundance is uh, at the 10 parts per trillion level, which is actually too low for us to detect with a mass spectrometer. So the only way to make this really nice scheme work is to have somebody actually go and measure the rate coefficients. And uh, that seems like a simple thing to do, but uh, bottling up hydrogen with all these other species and uh, cranking up the pressure and the temperature requires a lab safety application of some kind. Thank you. By the way, there are chemical kinetics labs and they're all in the combustion industry where they use um, have very high oxygen mixing ratios and essentially no hydrogen, which is not useful to us. Say that again? Well, there are two with hydrogen, you mean. Yeah, so the problem with adding hydrogen is you have to have uh, special bombs and so on in which, you know, you deal with the explosive nature of hydrogen if it happens to leak out into the lab. The other problem we found is that those, um, they're all companies, right, because it's all propulsion rockets and so on, and they're just not interested in doing this. There used to be labs like this at places like JPL 50 years ago, but they never actually measured under these conditions. So it's really got to be a scientific lab um, where somebody has to convince a company to spend the money to do it. Okay, and I'm, I apologize, I'm going to leave because I'm going to teach a class by WebEx now. <laughs> and it's going to be on protoplanetary accretion disks, coincidentally. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, I will come back to this again. It's still, again, another very old topic for the AGNs, but I try to give some uh, new insights that we can learn from the uh, new studies. So talking about the AGNs, the whole problem we try to understand, this is the uh, old spectrum for the uh, SEDs for the uh, AGNs, typically. Well, people believe that most of the uh, emission, particularly around the big blue bump, is produced by the accretion disk around the AGNs. Particularly, the, we think that right now, for example, the standard thin accretion disk, maybe the one that can describe this. The basic argument that if you take the, the typical temperature estimate from the standard thin accretion disk and plug in the, the mass of the black hole, like 10 to 8 or 10 to 7 black hole mass, the typical temperature 
is around the range that are uh, responsible for the thermal emission around the big blue bump. Th that is, uh, I think, that is the most important reason people believe the thin disk model. But if you look into the details of the thin disk model and try to understand the, the AGN spectrums of the whole wide range of wavelengths, you find there are a lot of puzzles from both the observational point of view and the theoretical point of view. So by observation, for example, when you look at the SEDs of the most AGNs, they will typically have a turnover around 1,000 Armstrong. That does not exist if you just try to calculate the spectrum from the standard thin disk model. And also, like for the AGNs, we see a lot of uh, outflows for some uh, AGNs. Uh, particularly, the part of thing, the so-called uh, ultra-fast outflow. But t normally, uh, we think the outflow is driven by the lines. But for the ultra-fast outflow, the, the outflow velocity is much faster, is much larger than what the lines can do. If you try to connect the outflow velocity with the typical capillary velocity of the disk, those outflow presumably will come uh, much in the out, uh, inner part of the disk compared to the uh, line regions. And also, if you look at the spectrum and the typical temperature of the AGNs, based on the thin disk model, you expect that you will see some like lemon edge in the AGN spectrum, but, but we, do, we never see that clearly. The reason the observational uh, estimate based on the micro lensing or the correlation between different bands of the AGN spectrum try to infer the, the size of the AGN disks, that usually found to be a factor of few larger than what you will get from the, the standard thin disk model. Those are observational constraints. Of course, theoretically, since the uh, standard thin disk model is proposed, we know that the radiation pressure dominant accretion disks are thermally unstable. That's particularly true in the inner part of the AGNs. The ratio between the uh, radiation pressure and the gas pressure can be like uh, thousands. I think in order to um, try to get some insight of those products, I try to just summarize some of the few basic assumptions that are in the standard syntax model. Then we can see what can be changed if we, uh, if we try to make some progress. Of course, the basic assumption that the, in the syntax model is that the emission is the uh, thermal. That is actually the only assumption you need to make if you want to get a temperature close to the big blue bound for the super mass black holes while well, temperature will be much hotter for the star mass black holes. And in the standard thin disk model, the only important opacity uh, is basically just the electron scattering plus some free field opacity for the absorption. Normally in the re uh, radiation pressure dome regimes, the electron scattering opacity is much larger than the free field opacity. Of course, uh, and those are details that, uh, uh, that is uh, the thin disk model assumes that you have viscous heating balanced by the radiative cooling and the stress and proportional to the pressure. And just to make a comment that because the thin disk model in the opacity is dominant by electron scattering, and electron scattering is based on constant. So that is why the thin disk model can scale to different black hole mass. We try to scale down from the star mass black holes and to the super mass black holes, but electron scattering is still a constant. That's why the many people try to study, for example, study the star mass black holes and try to scale the result to the most super mass black holes. But that is the assumption. So one, one important uh, difference we realize that is uh, wrong, particularly for the AGNs, for that assumption is actually the opacity, as implied by my uh, the title. So the, the actually, why, what crude way you can estimate the typical temperature and density that will uh, be in the AGN disks? You just assume a thermal emission. You take the typical energy luminosity, take the typical size, like the order of the Schwarz radius, and you estimate the temperature around a few times 10 to 5K for like super mass black holes. You try to get some estimate of the density, that is more uncertain because you require some assumption on the inflow velocity. But you take some typical like the sun speed, you get some density around like a 10 to minus 9 to 10 to minus 8. But the most interesting is that in this typical temperature and density regimes, we know for a long time that when people study the massive star, the amount of massive stars, that is exactly in the same temperature and density regimes as you will get from the amount of massive stars. And people have calculated the, what, what should be the opacity in those regimes. That is the, the typical, this plot is taken from basically the OPEL opacity project. 
you calculate the opacity contribution, particularly for all the metals. And you will notice that around the two times time, uh, two times twenty five k, there's a particular opacity bump that is dominated by the ions. Of course, uh, because it's dominated by the metals, you must, you are, this will depends on the metallicity. So this particular part is made for the solar composition, basically. And you notice that this this is basically the electron scattering value. So the the the, the big difference, uh, if you consider the realistic opacity, that the opacity can be increased by a factor of few, like for this particular case, depends on the uh, density. Actually, the opacity bound is not that sensitive to density. For a wide range of density, the, the enhancement of the opacity can be a factor of three to four. If you increase the metallicity, this uh, uh, the enhancement can even be a factor of uh, 10, for example. Of course, why this is important? Because, before I go there, just to make a comment that this is because people normally think that well, why opacity is, uh, will change will affect the structure because if you take the flux coming from the disk and times the opacity, that is the radiation force. If you take the same amount of flux and uh, multiply the opacity that is larger by a factor of four, for example, then your radiation force will be much larger than what you will guess just based on electron scattering opacity. Of course, if this is an optical thick. Uh, uh, accretion disk, the opacity also will change the cooling. And that is the whole thing that we try to study, how this uh, change the structure of the disk. So the way we study this uh, is based on the so-called local Schoenbach simulations. So what you should uh, imagine that if you have a disk, uh, this is the radial, uh, radial uh, azimuthal direction, and you have a radial direction on the short side, and this is basically the vertical direction of the disk. So what you can do here that you can basically you allow the MI turbulence to derive so consistently to provide the heating, and then you allow the photon to leave from the uh, top and bottom of the disk. To uh, basically, we do the self-consistent region transfer without any uh, uh, closure assumptions. And then you can see how the structure of the disk will change. And the thing that we do is that basically the one thing, you put the opacity table I just showed, and then you compare the case if you just assume the electron scattering and the free field opacity, are in the standard thin disk model, and then you can see how the disk will uh, change when you use different opacity. So this is the case that uh, if you use, uh, use the uh, the so consistent uh, ion opacity bump that we take basically from the all power opacity project. So you can uh, what I plot here is the history of the radiation density, magnetic energy density, and the gas internal energy density. And uh, this is the mass of stress, the Reynolds stress, and this is the equivalent. Uh, the uh, alpha parameter, basically the ratio of the stress and total pressure. And the, the time scale here is uh, in orbit. So in those simulations, the thermal time scale is uh, around like a 10 orbit or so. So one thing you notice that the disk can last for more than 14 thermal time scales without showing any significant uh, thermal runaway. In my view, the only way you can conclude whether the disk is, uh, is more uh, close to thermal equilibrium or not is by looking at the total heating and the cooling rate. This part, I just uh, calculate the total heating and cooling rate in the disk as a function of mid frame pressure. Well, it's noisy because it's a turbulence, but they check each other very well during the whole simulations. That's why they can last much longer. It will be more, uh, more clear if you compare the case that uh, if you just replace the, uh, the ion opacity table with the pure electron scattering and the free free, so you can notice that the disk will basically collapse very quickly within a few uh, summer time scales. The difference between the three lines that we, we use the same surface density at the previous one, and the second case, we try to increase the surface density, find that the total optical depth through the disk is the same when you use the electron scatter and the ion opacity. The third one, that we, we start with the initial condition that is already turbulent, and then you see that the disk can, can behave very different. So in the last uh, two minutes or one minute, I will, I will just try to explain briefly why is the ion opacity peak will change the structure of the disk. That is the point actually where the vertical structure of the disk make an important effect on the uh, stability and structure of the disk. You notice that because the ion opacity peak have very sensitive dependence on temperature, the ion opacity bump only exists in a certain temperature range. So what happens is that when the disk becomes uh, hotter, the bump will move further out. When the disk becomes the cooler, the bound will move further in. And because density is larger in the mid plane, so what happens is that when the disk is hotter, uh, which is represented by the mid pressure, 
the total upper depth basically decreases. So when the same is true when the total pressure is smaller, the total upper depth increase. So you basically establish an anti-correlation between the total upper depth and the, and the mid-plane pressure, so you get the enhanced cooling. This is a busy plot, I don't have time to show all the details. But second thing is actually very similar to the massive stars. When you increase the opacity by a factor of few, so what it means that the diffusion is very, uh, very inefficient. And in the, in the star case, if your upper depth is very large, your photon cannot uh, take away all the energy. And actually the magnetic buoyancy basically can, uh, 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 kick in. And the magnetic buoyancy can take the energy out by the advection part. So when the increase the optical depth, the advection flux can actually be more important compared to the diffusion flux. That is another way you can increase the cooling. This is my final size. Well, a good theory will not only be able to explain the existing data, but should be able to make some prediction that can be actually ch uh, checked. So one important implication is that if the ion plastic bound is the key thing that can make the disk, uh, a particular agent disk more stable, and this probably should have some dependence on the metallicity. Because as I said, that the ion plastic bump will basically become very weak if you do not have the metals, and will become very strong if you have a, a super solar metallicity. Actually, for some of the AGNs, people do infer the metallicity can be super solar. So that will mean that the property of the AGN, for example, the stability or variability, will have some dependence on metallicity. That should be checked. And another important thing that because of the enhancement of the opacity, although for some of the AGNs we normally think it's a sub antenna based on the estimate of the electron scattering, but when the opacity is enhanced, the, the, the local real antenna ratio can be super antenna. Just also make a very similar analogy of the massive stars. If your local super antenna uh, ratio can be super antenna, the opacity bomb can also drive significant outflow. And that outflow should come from region that are much inner compared to the region that come from the line chain wind. And with the, basically with the increased uh, antenna ratio locally, you expect that the disk scale height at the ion passing region should also be increased. This is actually, this is not my cartoon picture of what the disk should look like. This is a cartoon drawn by observers that they think that there should be have some bump in the inner region of the disk that can help to uh, explain many properties of the AGM of the visions. But what is interesting is that the near bumper around like 13.6 EV, and that is actually very similar in the temperature range as you would expect for the ion passive bump, because this is around like 10 to 5K. So the ion passive bump will naturally give you a bump in the disk scale height as you will need from the observers. That's it. Thank you. Yeah. Which only depends on temperature. And for example, line driven winds in stars rely on frequency, right? You yeah. push with a given frequency, then you push at a higher speed, you're absorbing frequencies which are different. So how do you envision? So this is a, yeah, the so ion passive bomb is a little different compared to the uh, normal line driven wind. This is actually in the upper thick regimes. So this is a, the ion passive bomb is caused by a, a lot of bond bond transition in the ions. So it basically affects the continual opacity. And that the most important thing is the temperature, that because that determines the inundation state of the ions. Okay. Great. Okay.